The Pedestrian by American developer Skookum Arts is one of these games I probably would have missed out on if it weren't for a friend who sat me in front of a computer to give it a try. Not knowing what I was getting into, the first steps definitely felt a bit experimental, but as they say, you have to learn how to crawl before you run, which became incredibly easy only a few minutes later. So in this chapter, we will embark on a stick figure adventure and find out how the pedestrian walks so effortlessly without a single word of explanation. I'm Miriam, and you're watching Game Design Grimoire. If you've seen the first chapter, you might remember this UI matrix. I won't get into the details this time, so if you missed it, I recommend you to go watch it and then come back. What is important for today's analysis is the fourth category, diegetic UI, thus elements which are simultaneously part of the game's world and the game's story. And that's the only type of UI that you'll come across in the pedestrian, even the settings menu can be accessed through a TV cleverly hidden away in the background. Now, the elephant in the room question is, why do developers decide to forego a headset display or HUD, or even other types of more virtue UI elements? What do you think? Take a moment. I believe the most common answer will be connected to the notion that the user interface is a constant reminder that the game we're playing, as realistic as it might look, is inherently artificial. Moreover, the countless stats and pieces of information that tend to be on screen at all times are seldomly needed altogether at any given moment, and can thus distract from what is going on in the game space. Therefore, foregoing a HUD allows developers to eradicate the risk of information overflow and distraction, so that players can concentrate on what is most pertinent. Some of you will probably also have thought about the word immersion. There are two issues with immersion, the first of which is the way we use and define or fail to define this word, a topic that Adam Mullet so eloquently discussed in his video essay on the question what immersion actually means. The second issue is that working without a HUD does not automatically lead to a more immersive game experience, but might actually cause the opposite. It might become even more difficult to navigate, crucial information in combat might be missing, and gameplay overall can feel less intuitive. The most valuable lesson from this is to ask why the respective game would work better, restricting itself to diegetic UI elements. And only if developers can find good answers to this question, there is a chance of it working out in the intended way, creating an experience that feels as seamless as that space, which is perhaps the top contender for games that mastered the arts of immersive UI design. Similarly, by tapping into a different genre and aesthetic altogether, the pedestrian takes us on a lighthearted stroll through an urban metropolis, all while making it seem self-explanatory that the only things holding your hand are sketches on a sheet of paper clipped to a whiteboard, short clips flashing on a screen to the side, or sticky notes stuck onto a wall in the background. Therefore, let's discuss what goes into creating a game that gives the player everything they need to know without a HUD. To begin with, I'd like to introduce you to a notion that game designer and professor Jesse Schell talks about in his book The Art of Game Design, A Book of Lenses, something he calls the elemental tetrad. What this refers to is essentially the interconnectedness of the different building bricks that constitute a given game's design. There are many possible ways to break down the parts of game design, and especially when the goal is to make concrete choices about the game's mechanics, it will be useful to have a lower level look at them. A very simplified high-level representation such as this one can, however, be incredibly useful as a sort of guiding star for brainstorming or a tool to check in during the design process and verify that you're still on track towards the intended vision. While every one of these elements holds the same importance, the model conveys a difference in visibility, with aesthetics being the most and technology being the least visible from the perspective of the player. The intention of viewing a game through the lens of the elemental tetrad is to understand which aspects need to be considered, how they relate to each other, and ultimately to tie all of them together in a way so that they support each other to pinpoint the core experience the game is aiming at. Personally, I like to think of it as one of these wooden star puzzles that will hold together purely by the balance and force when all of its parts are interlocked correctly. Another concept that goes hand in hand with the elemental tetrad is the lens of unification at the core of which is the question whether the main theme is supported by every possible means. As an example, Shell takes a look at Tomohiro Nishikado's Space Invaders, 
And since it's quite useful to gain a better understanding on how to use these tools, I'll give you a quick rundown. The central theme can be described as defending your home against wave after wave of an approaching alien army. It is a high-stakes situation, and the more invaders you exterminate, the higher your score. In terms of technology, Space Invaders was distinctive, since its motherboard, which was constructed specifically for the game, allowed players to fend off an advancing army for the first time. Mechanics-wise, the game made excellent use of the very limited resources it had. Players can hide behind shields, earn extra points by shooting a UFO, all while dodging beams fired by the aliens and trying to shoot back at them. And since the game either ends with the aliens reaching the player's home planet to wreak havoc, or by them destroying the player's ship to once more wreak havoc, there is no need for an additional mechanic to set a time limit. The most famous mechanic, however, is probably that the more of the aliens you kill, the faster they become, building up tension in the face of the looming doom from above. The story was initially planned with human enemies in mind, but was later changed to an extraterrestrial threat, which fit all the more into the futuristic theme of computer games and had less controversial potential. Last but not least, the aesthetics, as simple as they may be, made the most out of what was possible, and through colored plastic glued to the physical screen of the arcade machine, even brought color to a monochrome display. What is more, the aliens were accompanied by a sort of heartbeat noise that increased in speed together with the invaders, which reinforced the feeling of a relentlessly approaching threat. As Shell sums it up, and I've adjusted the quote a bit, part of the key to Space Invaders' success was that all of the four basic elements reinforced the same theme and support one another to create the experience of battling an alien army. And with that, we're heading back to the pedestrian. In this case study, I won't get too much into the technological details, but you will find Skookum Art's YouTube channel linked below, since they have uploaded quite a few devlogs which explain the technical design of the different levels in greater detail. For now, let's begin our journey with the mechanics. If we were to boil down the central gameplay of the pedestrian, it would be the puzzle solving through rearranging and connecting public signs in order to advance through the levels. Not only is this idea innovative, but it is also very compelling when looked at in the context of semiotics, which is one of the most multifaceted fields of study that you can come across. In simple terms, semiotics revolve around signs and symbols, and how they create meaning. Its central concept is that in communication, especially visual communication, there's always a signifier, one that emits the meaning, and a signified, or the meaning that is communicated through the signifier. As this definition already suggests, public signs are the perfect example to show the functionality of semiotics, since visual languages have a smaller need for text and written explanation, which is a good starting stone if you want to use diegetic UI. And looking at the developer's Kickstarter, this idea was at the center of the game from the beginning. No more walls of text. All puzzle mechanics are taught using symbols and animation, while story elements are portrayed during gameplay. The real-world public sign system was created to give information without the use of text, eliminating the barrier of language. Thus, the pedestrian uses simplistic sign-style symbols in order to convey needed information for gameplay. A red octagon with a white border and the capital letters STOP signifies for you to stop before the white line indicated on the road ahead of you. A red circle with a bold hyphen inside tells you that you're not allowed to go that way and a white arrow inside a blue circle shows you which side of the road to continue on. At least that's the case where I live, so no guarantee if your country does it differently, or if you live in a country that regards signs as a sort of street decoration that are nice to look at but not to follow. And with the pedestrian taking place entirely in the signage and displays of the busy traffic inherent to an urban metropolis, making use of their significance is nothing short of brilliant. Signs in the game maintain a connection to their original function, everyday logic being transferred to the in-game world. And at the same time, the signs are placed in an environment that could be called their natural habitat, which makes it useful in terms of upholding the suspension of disbelief. On top of that, the game walks the thin line of adding new components and mechanisms to the puzzles in a way in which a logical progression is kept intact. From the starting scene onward, we learn that the sketches are basically the layout of the levels and their explanation at the same time. 
We start inside of one single street sign, with new elements being added step by step, letting us cross from one sign to another, such as doors or ladders. And eventually, one of these ladders leads us outside of the sign and onto the display of a Game Boy, which is a bit surprising, but still kind of makes sense within the rules of the world the game takes place in. This results in a change of perception, since it teaches the player to venture outside of the boundaries of a given sign and use objects in the environment to their advantage. What makes this even more interesting is that upon solving the puzzle, we observe a ripple effect influencing the objects around us, for example by making an elevator move that transports us to the next segment. All of this interaction between us and our immediate vicinity inevitably creates the feeling of a bustling interconnected world that we, as the pedestrian, adventure through. Which brings us to the second point, story. And in this specific case, it actually proves useful to look at both the narrative and the aesthetics together, as the game heavily relies on visual storytelling. As you pave your way from sign to sign, you get to have sneak peeks into what living in the city might feel like. A work desk with an empty cup of coffee, some scrambled notes to decide, or the cracks on the wall already tell you a great deal about the city and its inhabitants. Sometimes I just outright stopped what I was doing because I was just so surprised by how elaborate the set pieces were, and how fully fledged out the environment was, even if it only served as a backdrop for the most part. And although I seldomly felt the need to take a break as the game played so fluidly, finding all the pause screen TVs underpinned how well and thoroughly the world was designed. The use of color also plays a crucial role in terms of visual storytelling. As explained in this video by one of the devs, the colors used to set the stages of any given level, as well as the ambience and lighting, are meticulously crafted to reinforce the narrative of an urban fairy tale that our pedestrian embarks upon. And as the name already gives away, the idea behind this is to match visuals and story to achieve a more impactful experience. Finally, the game's audio design gives a finishing touch with its whimsical jazzy melodies that paint an auditory image of the upbeat and vibrant New York-like city we get to explore, but equally excels at emphasizing the mood changes once we drop down into the sewer or take a train ride across downtown. And as an honorary mention, I also wanted to bring up the philosophy of design by subtraction, which many people associate with the works of Fumito Ueda and Team Aiko, the likes of Shadow of the Colossus or The Last Guardian. The pedestrian, while playing on a very different field, shows a similar awareness for what it wants to be, and ditches any elements that might distract from rather than support the essential experience it aims at. And in trading extent and features such as additional stages, collectibles or dialogue, the game delivers a highly polished and intuitive puzzling experience. What makes the pedestrian work so well without the presence of a HUD is the sharp focus on and interconnectedness of the quintessential elements that compose the experience. Because everything from the environment, over music and audio to level design, feeds into the shared theme of an urban fairy tale, hopping from sign to sign, the developers created a game that communicates its nuts and bolts so clearly that it doesn't need to give the player information through additional UI or lengthy explanations. In fact, the only thing that adding texts, level names, etc. would entail is to diminish the experience. And that, in my opinion, is an incredibly good answer for the question raised in the beginning. The pedestrian certainly was an unexpected one for me. But then again, all great adventures begin unexpectedly, don't they? I hope this gave you an insight into different ways to approach game design in general, and UI design in particular. Feel free to share your thoughts below. If you enjoyed the ride, leave a like, and if you want to be in the front seat for when the next video will be released, consider subscribing to the channel. With that, I'll sign off for this chapter, catch you in the next one!